folks, if we could uh, come to order. Okay, welcome to this meeting of Cabinet. Thank you for your uh, attendance. Um, before we, we get into the, uh, the main business, uh, I've got the very pleasant duty of um, talking about an award that we have recently won, which is fantastic news. And I'm going to ask Jeanette, um, Cabinet Member for Finance, if she, Jeanette, could you just introduce this and tell us what the award's about? Okay. Yeah, really, really pleased. I never normally um, do this bit in finance, so it's great to uh, announce that we're all was uh, commended for this award um, at the National Social Value Award Conference last week. So this was given to us for the work that we're doing around the Curly as Apprenticeship Scheme. Um, we've also been shortlisted for a local government chronicle award, so this is we're helping our care leavers get into apprenticeships, we're doing a lot of work around social value, we're doing a lot of supportive work with our care leavers in other respects as well. So I'm really, really chuffed. Uh, Nikki Butterworth, she's not here, that's a shame. She's done a lot of work around this. Um, so I'm really proud, yeah. And, and, and um, it was noted by the, the um, who, who ran the awards, the people who ran the awards to say that um, Despite the fact the programme's just started, it's already delivering tangible results and looks like it will provide a blueprint for many other councils and we're all is one to watch. So that's fantastic. Yeah. No, no, that is uh, that is terrific news. And I think the you know the fact that we we are helping and facilitating camp care leavers to get apprenticeships is, is a is a really brilliant uh, initiative and I know it's one that um, um, you know, particularly Bernie, I think you've been you've been uh, involved in as well, and um, uh, I think it's um, it's something that we need to, to build on uh, and do and do more of. But it's great to have kind of national national recognition on that. So, uh, congratulations to to all all concerned um, on on that. So, we we'll just recall that in a minute. So I'd be really grateful. Um, I need to just give Councillor Brightmore's apologies. He's unable to be here today so that could be recorded and um, the next item is members code of conduct declarations of interest do any members prepare any interest for Lisa? Thanks Chair, um, I'd like to declare an interest in agenda item 11 for prejudicial interest on the room. Thank you. And a board member of the reason why. Yeah. A, board, a board member of the group. Okay, thank you. Any any other members wish to declare any interest? No, if not, okay, move on to item two, which of the minutes of the last meeting. Can we agree I sign them as a true record? Item three is um, executive key decisions. Uh, we've just got one to note there. Can we, can we know that key decision? Is that great? Thank you. Okay, then. So on to the uh, cabinet member reports. Uh, the, the first one, um, and this is a really important report focusing on the um, uh, Birkenham Commercial District and particularly the the work that the World Growth Company is going to be involved in. So I'm really delighted that this is uh, before us this morning. I'm going to ask Angie, Andy Davis, the cabinet member, to introduce this, please, Angie. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks Phil. Um, regeneration and inclusive growth are at the heart of this administration's 2020 pledges. In February this year, cabinet agreed a joint venture partnership between News Developments and uh, World World Council. And this joint venture partnership is known as World Growth Company. Um, the Growth Company was created to lead regeneration across the whole of our borough. Um, in the first phase, it's proposing to progress public consultation in relation to Malton, Babington, West Kirby, Bromborough and Birkenhead. What today's report is about seeking cabinet's approval 
to start a broad and inclusive consultation on rural growth companies, redevelopment of Birkenhead Town Centre. So this consultation is going to be about listening to and engaging with local residents, community groups and businesses so we can hear their ideas and views um, on a master plan for Birkenhead Town Centre. At the heart of our town centre will be the Birkenhead Commercial District and this will comprise of a new iconic market, an improved retail and leisure offer, improved and sustainable public realm and over 300,000 square foot of grade A office space. This grade A office space is going to be an amazing opportunity for the public sector, the voluntary sector and the private sector. So the council has an excess of 1,700 back office and administrative staff spread out across multiple buildings and sites. And this report includes a business case to bring together many of these staff into a modern, efficient, accessible and centrally located commercial district. So there's, there's multiple benefits to, to co-locating these staff in a central uh, town centre location. The first one is around improved communication and improved joint <coughs> working. Um, the second one is around a reduction in expensive leases and maintenance. Um, the third one will be a really positive impact on footfall into the area and, and this is you know going to bring um, you know increased uh, economic um, impact into the area. People want to have somewhere where they can go and get coffee, have some lunch, do some shopping, um, and then go out, go out after work. And number four, this will also act as a catalyst for other public sector, voluntary sector and private sector to be a part of Birkenhead commercial district. So early in 2019, <coughs> after analysis of the extensive consultation, um, rural growth company will submit a partnership business plan. And this plan will attract an investment of up to £150 million. Pounds. And this will be the largest single investment in rural ever made. This report is seeking approval for offices to identify and explore ethical <coughs> investment providers and opportunities. I'm delighted to be recommended to serve as the Chair of the World Growth Company Board of Directors and I will ensure that social value is at the heart of this joint venture partnership. I'm proud of the job opportunities and employment that this is going to create for so many individuals and families. I'm proud of the apprenticeships that will be created for so many young people in our borough. Young people of Wirral will be building Wirral. I'm proud of the high local, bi local commitment we've made too. Um, we mustn't forget it will also bring in a really valuable um, income stream to the council for the next decade and it will help replace some of the lost income from the savage Tory cuts and austerity. Um, and it will help fund and invest in our essential services going forward. So it's for these reasons that I ask Cabinet to agree the seven recommendations on pages six and seven of the report. And I also have an additional recommendation that I'm asking Cabinet to agree. So the first recommendation um, is around initiating a consultation programme to reform the master plan the Birkenhead Commercial District. I'm asking you to agree the draft business case for the Birkenhead Commercial District that's going to be um, refined through um, the public consultation. Um, and I'm asking to agree the recommended funding approach going forward and authorise our Section 151 officer to initiate work on that forward funding model finance for the growth company. I'm asking Cabinet to agree the staff relocation business case um, with a view um, to retaining frontline services in our communities and this will result in the disposal, development and termination of leases at 14 existing sites. 
Um, I'm asking you to agree to a, uh, appoint my role for portfolio auditor for jobs and growth to chair the Borough Growth Company Board of Directors. The sixth one is about um, the Growth Company um, proposing to progress the public consultation in uh, Morton, Babington, West Coby, um, and Proper as well. Um, I'm asking you to approve capital expenditure from the budget set aside for strategic acquisitions to complete all land assembly around the um, Birkenhead commercial district boundary. The um, eighth recommendation, um, in November 2017, Cabinet agreed that Europa building would be bought to further the Council's ambitious plans for Birkenhead Town Centre. So I'm asking you to agree that we add this asset to the option agreement for World Growth Company. Um, World Growth Company is an absolute game changer. Um, agreeing these eight recommendations today is another really important milestone in this exciting regeneration and transformation of our world. Thank you, Angie. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to say a few words uh, on, in addition to Angie. Is there any other cabinet members wish to say anything? George, and then Stuart, and then Bert, and then Chris. George. Um, can I just say that, first of all, I'd, I'd like to welcome this. Um, it's been a long time in its, in its making. Uh, it's been well thought out. Um, and to think, coming through austerity from 2008 to where we are today, to have a scheme like this on the table in front of us, uh, for the benefit of the people of uh, Birkenhead and the rest of the world, because uh, it's not just about Birkenhead, it's about the rest of the world as well. And bringing our um, uh, our area completely back up to where it should be, um, and it's fallen behind in terms of, uh, in particular, the shopping precincts in the area. It looks tired, and it, 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 it's a long time it's coming. But being a Birkenhead lad, born and bred, uh, I really do welcome this scheme. I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic, um, morale boosting time for the people in the world. And um, I, I wholeheartedly support, and I hope that the rest of the people in Birmingham and the rest of the world will support this wholeheartedly in its consultation period as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, thanks, sir. Um, although, I think the clues on the name of World Growth Company, World Growth Company is about the world, uh, not just Birmingham, but this report says about Birmingham and, and as, a, as a lifelong. Um, I'm really proud to, to be part of the administration to make this, to make this a reality. Um, I, think, I think it's, it's going to be transformational, not just for the people that have uh, the area uh, and the infrastructure, but also for our staff. I think our staff are scattered across you know, multiple sites within the rural in really poor quality of accommodation. This is bringing everyone together in you know, modern, high quality office space. I think it's going to you know, improve you know, working conditions and morale uh, in the world. And, and obviously, if we you know, bring people together and a large number of people together, it's going to have a, a transformational effect on you know, small businesses and uh, you know, the shops in particular. Because obviously, you know, where there's people, there's football. Uh, that's going to, you know, that's going to generate uh, you know, small businesses. And I think I'm, I'm you know, confident that you know, with those small businesses, we will be moving cooperatives and, uh, and, and other
exactly what we get ourselves into and I think we have to all be proud of this growth company and the thought that's gone into it and the ambition that we have for people. So I endorse it a hundred percent. And I think the people of Willow will be will be glad that we're doing something that we're moving forward with such an ambitious plan for, for our young people and um, it's gonna be give us a good future, it's gonna put Willow on the map. So, I endorse it 100%. Okay, thanks, Bert. Chris. Thank you, Bert. Um, it is fantastic news for Will. I think um, with the University of Chester now um, coming to Birmingham as well, um, things are really sort of working out. The one plea I was going to make, Angie, the plans for symptom and they've been pushed back, I know, for different reasons. But as chair, I would be, you know, really ask you that you see if it doesn't get like that. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the whole point of the growth company. We're not just picking um, those those prime sites, you know. Um, it's about um, using some of the income that we generate um, from that to um, kind of fund other less viable sites. So. You know, Zika is certainly um, an area that, that we want to work on. Obviously, we've got to kind of generate some of that income first to, to um, you know, then fund those things. Okay, yes. Okay, so if I can, if I can jump in just to Thank you 
to not just yourself but the officer team that have put this together and I know I know that it's been you know a, a huge effort on the part of you know all of our officers from kind of economic development to the legal team to the surveyors to everybody involved in the council and it's and it's so um, it's so great actually that it's now come to fruition and I say I, I, I'm convinced it will be a success. And I think finally, this, this is clearly, uh, as a number of you said, um, this is just phase one. Um, and this is genuinely a model that I think we, we will roll out, we will roll out across the whole world. And so no area will be left behind. So for all of those reasons, I'm, I'm delighted you know, to, to endorse what you've said, Angie. And um, you know, uh, I, I really look forward to see, seeing the growth company Well done to everybody. Okay. Right, okay, so that just leaves, leaves us. Angie's move recommendations on pages six and seven with the additional yeah. recommendation that you just read out, which, which I hope we've, we've got recorded, surely. Yeah, okay. So, can I see all those in favour? Okay, count unanimously. Okay, so thank you very much to everybody. Onwards and onwards. Great, thank you. Right. Um, Right, that moves on, us on to uh, item five, uh, which is uh, leisure and cultural services, future provision of the Ford Pavilion Theatre and Conference Centre. Now, unfortunately, as I say, unfortunately, Phil Brightball, the cabinet member um, for this area, can't be with us this morning, um, but I will, I will introduce this, this report and move recommendations. So this, this report, I just want to say a few, few words by kind of setting the scene. Both this report and the next one on, on golf courses is, is really um, all about how we can sustain uh, into the future these two really important services for the world. So on, on the floor, we know, don't we, that um, given the cuts that, that we, we've got to, uh, to deliver, um, discretionary services, uh, are really being squeezed within not just world but all local authorities, and um, you know the, the leisure services element of, of what we do is particularly, uh, I think, under, under pressure because of the, the, the funding pressures that we've got elsewhere in the budget, notably around social care. So um, we we need to come up with innovative ways of making sure that these discretionary services, I mentioned leisure, but we've also got highways. And you know, other, other services as well. We need to come up with innovative ways in which we can continue to fund these services going forward. And, you know, the Floral Pavilion is a much loved um, facility. It's coming in for its 10 year uh, anniversary in, in December. Um, and where, where, where's that time gone? It's just amazing that we're, we're talking about a 10 year anniversary. But um, we, we face a challenge around being able to make sure we can fund that facility going forward in a, in a way that um, is, is sustainable. Um, so Phil Brightmore and the officer team have, have done a lot of work around reviewing kind of the options which are sort of set out in, in the report. But the, just to kind of cut to the chase really, the proposal is that we think that the best chance of sustaining the, the, the floor financially is to talk about a, a long-term transfer to a long-term lease to a specialist kind of theatre um, production company or something akin to that that, that has got the economies of scale, um, can bring the big, the big um, shows and performances to Wirral and to New Brighton and um, you know has got that, uh, that expertise. Um, so the, the proposal uh, is essentially that we should look at, at that model. I want to stress that this is not a sell-off, so the council will retain the freehold, but this is a tr transfer and long lease. And we will obviously build in kind of safeguards to any uh, transfer around things like it can only be used as a theatre. Um, and clearly we, we are talking with our trade union colleagues around the, the issues around duplicate transfer, etc. because we want to make sure that the staff are protected as, as far as we can. Um, but this is, a, this is a proposal that we think 
gives the floral an opportunity to um, to be sustained financially into the future. Because I don't want to get to a situation in 2021 when the revenue support that money works out. There's no government support whatsoever, and literally these facilities, which are discretionary, we've got no money to fund. So we need to be doing the work now to put the the measures in place to make sure that when that cliff face happens, we have got we have got a solution to make sure that these facilities like for all are, are continuing going going forward. So in, in essence that is the that is the proposal and I think the other thing to stress that the we're saying that this um, this suggestion should be part of the consultation with the budget option so there'll be further opportunity for people to comment on this and particularly I'm keen that um, we uh, continue the discussions that Phil's been having with, um, with our trade union colleagues to make sure that we've got a model which you know, they're comfortable with going forward. So in essence, that is the proposal in the recommendation um, set out on page, on page 30 of, the, um, of this report. Anybody want to ask any questions or make any comments? Or shall I just move that recommendation? Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay, that's agreed. Thank you. Okay, so that takes us on to item six, which is the uh, review of leisure libraries and cultural services are golf courses. So again, this is a very similar argument um, to the argument I've just articulated around the, the floral. Um, again, we, we need to find a way of making sure that our golf courses are sustainable going forward. Um, so the proposal is that we look at a, a again a transfer on a long-term lease to uh, a specialist uh, golf provider. Uh, again, with the safeguards built in that this is a um, this is a transfer, it's not a sale. Um, that um, the these golf courses can only be used for golf courses, and um, that uh, again the the comments I made about the staff to be transferred prior to this as well. I think the um, we've been looking, or Phil, Phil and the team have been looking at the experience of the local authorities. Um, we're a number um, over water that have transferred municipal uh, courses in the same way as we proposed here. I think the, um, the, the benefits are that, again, the, the, a specialist provider will have the capital that we simply don't have to upgrade the, the golf courses. Some of them need significant amounts of work. And we're also um, uh, uh, highlighting the, the, hopefully, the possibility that this could generate um, an income, an ongoing income to the council of between 110 and 214,000 a year, which again, given our budget challenges uh, will, will, will be welcome. We, we can reinvest that money in frontline public services. Um, so, again, a bit like floral, this is a, a proposal that we think gives, um, and we're, we're particularly focusing, obviously we're focusing in this report on Arrow Park and Warren uh, golf courses. We think this gives these courses and this service the best chance of being sustained into the future. But again, we'll be doing the, 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 the consultation uh, as part of our, of our budget options to continue to discuss um, the, um, you know, the implications of this with our, our, our trade union colleagues. So um, I think it's, it's something that we've got to, we've got to look at to, for all the reasons I mentioned with the, uh, the challenges around the budget. So uh, I'm just going to point you then to the, the recommendations in the report on page page 40, and I'll, I'll formally move those recommendations. They agreed? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, so that moves us on to a series of reports now around budget monitoring. So item 7 is the quarter 2 budget monitoring report on revenue, which Jeanette's going to introduce, please. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, you set the context of um, our, our budget there, and it was quite heartening to see our local entries at least taking part in the parliamentary debate a few weeks ago around the pressure on local government sand funding. Um, so I'd like to say that none of this is very edifying. 
austerity, repeated and sustained austerity. There's nothing that any of us enjoy. Sitting down and working out how we can make savings. Um, every single time we meet, we're discussing savings. Let's just call them countries. We can't have to be in those ones by central governments. Um, but what we're not going to do on we're all to go the same way as in Northamptonshire and uh, raft of other councils, most of which are Tory, hating to have so they're not taking great money after all, are they? Um, we're not going to go bankrupt and we're not going to allow this council to be broken up and put into the hands of administrators. However, that, that leaves us with a really, really difficult task uh, ahead of us. So, not made any easier by Brexit, I have to say as well. But, the main points of this, this report are that there is uh, a slightly increased uh, overspend at in quarter two to £907,000. Um, we, we do plan to mitigate that. So at this time last year, the overspend was £1.2 million. We brought it in line by the start of this. So the same, same will happen again this year, but that's where we're up to. Um, there's a change to the bottom line budget that requires referral to council, so capital receipts funding of 1.1 million for children's services transformation programme being brought forward from 17-18 is to be incorporated into the 18-19 children's budget. And of course, Ben, you spoke about this a lot, pressure on children and adults. They're just growing, they're mounting. Austerity itself is causing people to come through our doors and require our services. But austerity is also diminishing our capacity to deal with that increased demand. And it's just a vicious cycle all the time. Um, but we do recognise that we're pressure within social care and that's why we have put lots, lots of additional funding there. So I, I'd just like the Cabinet to uh, note the recommendations and agreement, please. Uh, Force to forecast for the mid-year end is 0.907 million overspend. The offices continue to identify actions and take measures effectively manage the overall budget and the change to the bottom line budget in 0.3.2.2 and I was to refer to council for approval. Okay, thanks, um, thanks Jeanette. Anybody wish to make any comments on this report? If not, can we disagree those recommendations on page 50? Yeah. They agree, yeah. it? Thank you. Uh, item 8 is the quarter 2 budget monitoring report for capital. So Jeanette, <coughs> Um, and it's 
makes such a huge difference to people. And, and the people who attend that are the most profoundly um, disabled people. So it's just a thank you, really. Sure that when we get to that stage, we don't do, we don't fall into the 
position that other, so a number of authorities around the country are facing where literally they've gone bankrupt. So we can't allow as a responsible administration that to happen. And this report is, is continuing to explain the, the, the kind of strategy around how, we, how we're going to do that. Um, I mean, I think on a, on a more positive note, I, I welcome the specific items that the Chancellor announced in his budget that will benefit local government. So they're listed in 3.9. Um, you know, the church not to welcome the extra money for um, social care and um, disabled facilities grants and children's services and so on. The only comment I would make is um, that these do appear to be one-offs. Um, so grateful for the next 12 months, what happens after that. And I'm particularly concerned that the government have still not come up with any solutions to the biggest single challenge facing us and local government, which is the social care crisis. Uh, there was promise of a green paper. Um, I've not seen any evidence of that, but it seems to me until the government uh, address that issue, then it really makes it much more difficult for us to deal with all the other stuff that we've been talking about this morning, particularly around the discretionary services that we haven't got a statutory obligation to deliver. So I hope the government will uh, use the opportunity to come up with a, 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 recommend, a set of recommendations around how we deal with social care. We, we, uh, we know that the, there is a review going on of the future of local government funding, the, the so-called fair funding review. I've not been privy to any idea about what that might throw up. Um, but I think all we can say is there is still huge uncertainty around the future of local government funding post-2021. Uh, and and in, the, in the absence of any, any certainty, we've got to do things now at a local level to make sure that we can sustain good quality public services for our local residents going forward. And that's what this report um, seeks to do. You know, we know we've got huge pressures in there, I, I outlined in 311, around um, uh, adult social care. Chris, you've, you've mentioned that on a number of occasions. Children's services, we're, we're doing a fantastic job through New Bernie and Paul and the team about turning that service around. But there are huge pressures in that service. I, I want to sort of congratulate the team for the work they're doing on um, putting more focus on early intervention and prevention. That starts to address the demand issue. So, you know, I, I, I want to acknowledge that. And we've got a number of one-off funding um, items that we need to replace that we put in this year's budget, uh, amounting to 26 million. So the, there are significant budget pressures um, still in the system. We don't know what the final levies will be around Mersey travel and waste. Um, we won't know that until February of, of next year. So we, we need to um, start the process now of identifying how we're going to close that £45 million pound gap that we face in the budget for next year. I think the uh, medium term financial strategy sets out the kind of direction of travel and, and they're the, the kind of main uh, themes that we've been talking about for the last few years um, in terms of uh, how we address the budget. So identifying opportunities for generating additional income, obviously we mentioned the growth company, but the commercial, commercialism agenda we're going to talk about in a minute. Jeanette um, is, is another major way of doing that. Transforming services, coming up with the innovative new ways of doing